And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Barometer webcast. My name is Pamela Hastings, and joining me today is David Burroughs, President and Chief Investment Strategist at Barometer Capital. We will provide you with a market overview, and we'll have an opportunity at the end to answer your questions. So please feel free to email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or communicate with us via the chat. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Happy September 30th, David. Thanks, Pam. You know, for us market participants, it isn't always a happy thing to be entering October, uh, but clearly the, the wind is in the trees. There is a, a clear scent of an election around the corner uh, and, uh, and everybody thinks about Halloween's past. So I think it's a good time to have a conversation about what's going on market-wise, what we're seeing from our uh, market internals work, where we're positioned uh, and, and what we're watching as we go forward. And certainly I look forward to answering any, any questions as, as we go along. So Pam, thanks very much for opening things up today and thanks everybody for taking the time to join us today. Um, you know, uh, as always, I'm going to look at things through our lens. And as a tactical manager, I see it as our job really to do three basic things. One is to use the process that we built and execute on every day to try and identify clear market leadership. Structural themes in the market where due to some tailwind, uh, they have an inordinate ability to grow either uh, from, a, from an earnings perspective or the cash flow that they pay our investors on a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, we don't need to be everywhere. We need to own the things that are ripe on the shelf uh, where there are opportunities uh, and where we have the wind at our back. Um, second thing we're, we're charged with doing is recognizing change. When, when that leadership starts to run out of gas or when new leadership starts to take over so that we can reposition the portfolios in a timely way to make sure that we, we continue to be in parts of the market that people care about uh, and that we're, uh, we're good sellers. And then the, the third thing is there are some times when there's very little that's working uh, or big parts of the market are not working and we have to know what to avoid uh, and how to play some defense, whether that is uh, at the single stock level making sure that the, the companies that we own are behaving the way they should be behaving, given what we think we know, uh, or if we have to stop our way out. Uh, and, and as I think most people know, every position we enter, we identify a price below the price we've paid. And the difference between those two prices is our risk budget. And to the extent that the share price over three days, three months, or, or three years drops below that price point, we're gonna go to the sidelines. Stop losses are set using a tool that I use called point and figure charts, which help us to recognize when the trend of a security goes from higher highs and higher lows, that's an uptrend, to reverse into low, what looks like lower lows and lower highs. And there is an inflection point in every security where the odds of success go from in, being in our favor to being out of our favor. Uh, and so we set an initial stop loss and as a position works out as we hope or expect, will consistently ratchet the stop loss up in behind as we can see higher and higher inflection points that we could use. So there's a, there's a brief description, but the net of it is a big part of our job is playing defense. Uh, when we went through the sell-off in February, March, we had to raise cash. We had to stop our way out of positions, uh, obviously a very fast, sharp, bear market. Uh, and, and we were pleased to, to sort of limit it to half of the decline. So it is a very tactical approach. And through that lens, I wanna kind of talk about markets. You know, most of you who know us have seen me put a chart similar to this up on the screen, which is a long-term picture of the, of the uh, NYSE. Uh, and we can take any market and they look more or less the same. You get these long periods of advanced several year, multi-year structural or secular bear markets, or sorry, bull markets, where something has changed for the better and allows equities to be revalued over a period of time. So generally there is earnings growth, but not only is there earnings growth, but investors become prepared to pay a higher and higher multiple for those earnings as they consider the backdrop to be continually improving. Uh, there are sharp pullbacks in secular bull markets uh, like the 1987 crash, uh, but they tend in the aftermath to look relatively small. Once an asset class gets overowned and overpriced, 
uh, invariably it has to walk through the desert for a while. So in 1966, after the market rallying from 1951 to 1966 or, or 15 years, uh, market ran out of gas and had a series of cyclical advances and declines with the market made no progress until 1982 when we started the bull market in the 80s and 90s. Now every asset class looks like this. We think it's our job to understand the environment that we're in because different things work at different times. And we have to manage transactions, manage portfolios differently depending on the condition that we're in. We believe that when we exited the bear market between 2000 and 2013, where the market really made no progress, we started a new structural bull market. And we have been in that bull market for seven years with, with interruptions. If we look at the S&P, uh, this was the S&P exiting that bear market in 2013 uh, and has been in a steady channel up 10 trends since there. Now, 15, 16, there was good size correction. 2018, fourth quarter, very sharp correction. Of course, the, two, the February, March of this year, sharp correction, but very quickly back into that channel. So we believe we're in a structural bull market. Uh, that's the S&P. This is the NASDAQ 100. Actually, NASDAQ 100 didn't break out to new highs from 2000 until 2016. And so this is a much newer bull market. Uh, it's four years in length so far. Some would point out that's been going up for quite some time, but ultimately we didn't start getting real multiple expansion until 2014, 15, 16. So we've had a little pullback since the beginning of September. A lot of people have questions as to what that may uh, be the start of. Is it something short term in nature? Is it something longer term? We're going to discuss that a little bit. We know that the sell off in February and March was the sharpest bear market since 1927. It happened faster uh, and it went further than virtually any other bear market since then. And then of course we had a very, very steep, sharp recovery, much sharper than the average recovery where it might've taken a much longer period of time to get back to break even, of course, and then go on to new highs. It's even more remarkable given the fact that since March, there has been a steady flow of investors pulling money out of the market. So when we look at in white active equity mutual funds and ETFs and in yellow passive equity mutual funds and ETFs, we have seen outflows out of equities steadily every month since March. And so where is the money coming from? Well, there is captive money in the market in quantitative strategies, hedge funds. Uh, there, is, there are large institutional investors and pension funds who are always in the market. Uh, and always adding new money. Uh, but it is interesting to see that the flows have not been so supportive, but we've had a very good market. What is clear is there are a ton of investors who have missed the entire rally off the lows in March. And we have to keep that in mind because pullbacks are likely to be met with cash that's sitting on the sidelines, close to $5 trillion sitting in cash. The market's been a little more volatile than normal. 26% of days this year have been more than 1% moves up or down. So you have to go all, all the way back to the 1930s to have had that kind of daily volatility. So arguably, I understand why people are concerned about the volatility and have a hard time understanding this market. We highlighted at the end of uh, August, the beginning of uh, end of August, that there was a lot of speculation after this big rally the put call ratio or the number of people buying calls, betting on a higher market, way outnumbered the people buying puts, concerned about protecting themselves. We know the volumes in the most, most favored NASDAQ stocks from a call perspective went off the charts. We know that the number of people hedging against a falling market had declined significantly to multi-year lows, meaning investors weren't willing to fight the rally because of course it was such a brutal thing to be wrong. And we know that sentiment got to be quite euphoric. So we talked through the summer about the likelihood of some kind of a fall correction. We said, we don't think that this is a, a big deal, but we do expect sort of 10 to 15% pullback September, October, which would be typical seasonality for some kind of correction, especially headed into an election. Now, we can 
look at the newspaper, we can do our fundamental research, we can try and guess what the market may do, or we can measure what is actually happening. And in our view, what drives markets is cash, whether it's going into markets or coming out, and we need to know whether we have a headwind or a tailwind. When we go through a decline, everything doesn't sell off on the first day, the weakest securities sell off first. And as a sell off picks up steam, more and more securities are impacted until late in the decline, almost everything is hurt. If something isn't being hurt late in the decline, it's not by chance. It's because investors are so confident in those particular securities, they've wanted to hold on. And so often before a market bottoms, the leading securities quietly turn higher during the sell off. And if a few more securities participate, eventually people get a little more positive and then a few more perform well. And as you go through a healthy market, a higher and higher percentage of security should participate in the rally. So I call that expanding breadth, meaning that if you gave every security a single vote, say 1,500 of them in the NYSE, in a healthy market, over time, more and more of those 1,500 securities should be in clearly defined uptrends, higher highs and higher lows. I'm happy being invested when we see expanding breadth. That means money is coming in behind us. When, when late in an advance, the leaders carry on, but the weaklings start to fall away, that's narrowing breadth. That means there isn't enough new money going in, or there's enough money coming out where the risk reward levels change. Now that doesn't mean every security is gonna be hurt, but it means that at the market level, we no longer have the wind at our back. We have to raise a little bit of cash. We have to be more cautious with our stop losses and tighten them up closer to current market price. To the extent we get stopped out, the money should stay on the sidelines and we build a cash buffer. And we don't like to put more positions on so long as breadth is deteriorating. Now eventually, sooner or later, breadth starts to turn higher. It's always at a time when sentiment's really rotten. So it feels a little scary to put money to work, but then we know that money is actually starting to get put back to work for the combination of all the reasons that investors could make that decision. Okay, so last week we talked about the fact that breadth for equities has been weakening over the last month and a half. We got to it, so this is a percentage reading on the left-hand side. We got to a point where by the beginning of September, 60% of all of the individual stocks globally were in clearly defined uptrends. And that started to weaken in the first week of September. And since then, one by one, stocks have been breaking down. And as of this week, 42% of all the stocks globally are positive. I mean, there's lots of good ones, but the weaklings aren't garnering enough attention and they're selling off. So the wind really isn't at our back globally. When we take the NYSE, NYSE breadth topped out at 68%. And since the end of August has been weakening, we're sitting at 46%. So that means we've raised a bit of cash. It means we're reticent to put new positions on. It means we're hypercritical of our existing positions, fundamentally and technically. And we wait and see. So here's the S&P, the rally off the bottom in March. We had a little check back in June, but the market was able to regain its strength we continue to rally and of course we really ramped at the end of August, which is when we got a little concerned. And then the large cap stocks kind of rolled over 1st of September. We had a leg down. We traded back up and into this 21 day moving average, which really had been support for the market all the way since the beginning of the rally. Was unable to get through it. And so then we pulled back a second leg below the 50 day moving average. And now over the last four days, markets had another little bounce up underneath the 50 day moving average. So that's good, but it hasn't changed the fact that we're a little bit on the defense. Okay. If we take the NASDAQ, which has been the strongest market, very clearly stayed above the 21 day moving average all the way through the rally until the beginning of September, blasted through, rallied up underneath, failed, broke below the 50 day moving average and we're now back underneath that 21 day moving average. So three things could happen here. One, things could just repair and all of the things that people are concerned about for the fall disappear. And there's enough money in the market that it pushes prices higher. That's not showing up in our work currently. Second thing that could happen is that corrections happen two ways. 
They happen in price, by prices falling, or by time, things chop sideways for a while while the market finds its footing. And the market does some sorting during that period. Some sectors will behave better, some sectors will behave worse. So we need to look at breadth at the sector level to say, where is their appetite? Where is the money leaving? And what does the message mean? Okay. The TSX is very similar. Didn't rally as much as the S&P and, the, and the, the NASDAQ. It's still down about 10% off the highs. Topped a little bit earlier, about the third week of August. It's pulled back and is below its 50-day moving average. So what are the things that we've been looking at over the course of the week? Well, the first thing I'll mention is that when the, we had the first pullback in, in breadth, we held at 52%. We rallied into August after the June pullback it made a lower high, meaning fewer stocks were participating in the rally. And when breadth pulled back over the last two weeks, we've now pulled back to a lower low. So it means that things are weakening. Doesn't mean everything's broken. It could stop here and reverse. So we'd be critical at the sector level and at the stock level. So what are the things that people are worried about? Well, these are things that we're all reading about in the newspaper. We know that the cases in the US and certainly in Europe, have started to tick higher again. Europe is clearly in a second wave. The deaths are behind the cases, but of course that generally is the case because it takes time for people to get sick enough to, to, to go to the next step. We know in Canada, we've seen an uptick in cases in Quebec and in Ontario. Uh, BC is sort of flattened out. Alberta is getting a little bit worse, but we're having a similar experience as all the kids have gone back to university and to high school. We're a little bit worried about the election, okay? I'm sure a lot of you watched the debate last night. It certainly didn't resemble any other debate I've ever seen, um, but this is the world that we're in. I think that there is some investor concern that Biden has a pretty good lead over Trump in the polls, not probably because of his social policies, but probably because uh, they're concerned about what might come with a Democrat government. And VIX or volatility measures are, are, are pricing in a little bit more volatility through the month of October. So this would not be an unusual thing in an election year, but we're seeing a little bit more volatility priced in than in other years. Things I think that the market may be a little bit concerned about, right? Biden, while he's not spending much time talking about it, has, has, has as a platform that includes close to $4 trillion of new taxes, approximately $2, two trillion on individuals and $2 trillion on corporations. Now, not to say all of these would get passed. He'd have to win the Senate and a clear majority uh, in the House, and he, then he would have to bring all of his people alongside. But these are the types of numbers the market has to think about. When we compare the tax increases that he's proposing versus, say, Obama and Clinton, about 1.8% of GDP versus 1.2 for Obama and 0.7 for Clinton, they aren't insignificant. So we have to look at which sectors might be impacted by that. We need to think about some of the regulation that we may see put forward on things like the energy industry and fracking, on the fiduciary responsibilities that might get imposed on people giving advice on retirement savings, new regulation on banks, so some impact on financials and energy. What might happen from an antitrust litigation standpoint when it comes to some of the very large market dominating companies like an Amazon or a Google? What might happen to the healthcare industry if there was some clear targeting of say the pharmaceutical industry and the costs and prices that are being pushed through there? His policy, which he talked about last night in the debate, wanting to see the US government only spend money on things that were built in America. The potential for a large green bill pushing clean energy would be positive for clean energy, difficult for carbon-based fuel, and some of the things that may come with student debt. So there are lots of things for the market to ponder. The market doesn't like uncertainty, so this is something that the market is considering. On the other side, We've had some decent economic data over the last week. Consumer confidence was expected to come in at 91, came in at 101.80, way ahead of expectation. Now, it does matter that the U.S. consumer came into the crisis 
in the best shape the consumer's been in in 20 years. So up to this point, many, many consumers have been able to spend that cushion that they've had built up or use credit that they haven't been using. As of the end of August, it looks as though U.S. consumers, the average U.S. consumer may have used 60 to 70% of that cushion. So if this goes on for a long time, it could turn into a bigger deal. We, knew no, we know that new home sales have taken a sharp turn higher. People wanting to move out of apartments and new family formation coming from millennials and, baby, and, and uh, Gen Xs. Uh, we know that the U.S. consumer is spending, total spending is down about 3.8%. High income earners have cut back their spending by close to seven because of the lack of travel and uh, spending on luxury goods and low income spenders have actually spent uh, pretty well because of the support they've had up to this point from government. Jobless claims, which have been getting better, have sort of flattened out, but are nowhere near where they were when we headed into the pandemic. So this initial drop in unemployment and empl unemployment claims is probably going to be harder to make better in the near term from here. Last week, if we looked at our indicators, breadth for Canada, the US and globally all had been weakening and our short term indicators were all weakening. If we look at this week, we bounced a little. We've had some improvement in two short term indicators in the US, but still the majority continue to be cautious. If we look globally, almost every major region in the world is seeing deterioration in breadth. So we have to keep that in mind. If we look at from a sector perspective, the sectors on this chart in small letters are seeing deterioration in breadth. Those that are in capital letters are seeing expansion. So what do we see? Semiconductors, software, computer, technology, they're all continuing to lead. Internet gaming, continuing to lead. Home builders, continuing to lead. So let's take a look a little bit further. Also changed this week, fixed income breadth or bond breadth started to weaken. Now this is interesting because interest rates have been ultimately at like a 5,000 year low and bond prices recently have started to drop. Now that has something to do with the Fed saying that they will maintain low rates at the short end for a long time and let inflation potentially run a little hotter than they might otherwise. So if you're a 10 year or a 30 year bond investor on a fixed income, it makes those bonds less attractive. But that has implications for the market. This is the long term price of a, of a US long term bond. This just goes back to 2017. And we know that bond prices ran up sharply the early part of 2020. And then as the market has been correcting and getting, getting a little bit better, we've seen bond prices moderate and they start, look like they're starting to come lower. That has an impact on certain sectors. When rates bottomed in the 1940s, sectors that acted like bonds underperformed for 15 years. It looks as though we may be going through a similar bottoming in interest rates here, which means that if real yields turn higher, things like high yield bonds do worse. So then blue is the S&P 500, in yellow is, is, is high yield, high grade corporate debt. It is underperforming the stock market. That's what happened in the early 1950s. Also sectors that act like bonds, like real estate investment trusts. This is relative strength versus the market. Real estate is weakening relative to the market. You can see is still close to 26% below the highs in February. Higher rates, not good for real estate. High dividend paying stocks, down still 25.7% from the highs. While as you know, the stock market came back to the highs. So the safest sectors, the ones that act like bonds are underperforming, not interesting to us as it stands. Deflationary assets or things that act like bonds have outperformed for years while rates have been falling and inflationary assets underperformed. Recently, we're seeing better performance in inflationary assets. So other things that are underperforming, energy continuing to underperform, not interesting, we're not participating. Now, one of the things that's clear is there is gonna be some loan defaults 
by people who have taken leveraged loans. That would include probably some real estate investors and probably some energy companies. So that's putting pressure on banks, which continue to underperform, still down 39% from the highs. So this is a real market of have and have nots. The sectors that have been weak since the pandemic began continue to be weak. And then there are the alternatives. As opposed to carbon-based energy, clean energy is performing really well and would, have, would benefit under a Democrat government. So this is solar. You can look at many of the clean energy companies performing really well. This is an interesting area that has a tailwind and improving breadth. Also in technologies, software. Software companies having hitting a new relative strength high this week. They really did correct really for about two days and then they traded sideways while the market corrected and they are outperforming the market to the upside on the bounce. Semiconductors. Semiconductors pulled back briefly then started to rally, making a new relative high versus the market. Well, clearly cloud-based computing has a structural tailwind. Artificial intelligence and machine learning has a structural tailwind. Electronic gaming has a structural tailwind. Semiconductors are being included in everything. So when I look at, at what makes a trend, this is the price of the semiconductor sector, rally, pull back to a higher low, rallies, pull back to a higher low, rallies, pull back to a higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, and rallying again. That's an uptrend. Now, should the semiconductor start to pull back and breach the previous low, this is where our stop loss would be. Now, this is for an entire sector. We run one of these for every individual security and that's where our stop loss would be on this security. So we're not trying to protect against a pullback, we're trying to protect against a reversal in direction. Like say back here, in the beginning of 2020, February, we broke the lows from January and that kicked off a series of lower lows and lower highs. That's where we stopped out of our semiconductors in February. Other groups that continue to behave well. Consumer discretionary as a whole is hitting a new relative strength high versus the market. There are some very clear areas of leadership here, like for instance, the home builders and companies selling construction material and home improvement companies, companies like Home Depot, companies like Train that make infrastructure equipment uh, for the home, uh, companies like Ingersoll Rand that supply into the home building industry transportation stocks, the railroads hitting new relative strength highs versus the market. This includes truckers, logistics companies, uh, and railroads like CSX and CP Rail. Medical device companies continuing to see robust demand uh, and behaving very well against a, a sloppy market. Companies in biotech and uh, genetics research hitting new relative strength highs. You can see all of these groups behaving very differently than some of the sectors we started with. So it really has been a remarkable market. Growth-oriented assets have way outperformed and energy and financials and value have really underperformed. It's probably the broadest underperformance that we've seen in many years. So we wanna watch very closely for any signs of reversal. But the underperformance of value really only measures up to what happened in the dot-com bubble. Very important to be targeted. So the idea of owning only the S&P means you have to lug these groups along. We would prefer to stay focused. Gold has certainly pulled back over the last two weeks as the US dollar has had a bounce versus world currencies, but we think it's still relatively early in this theme. And clearly there's still a lot of monetary stimulus being pushed into the system. So look, our main long-term indicators are cautious. We're headed into October. We have some great positions and the sector work on our key sectors continues to be very positive, but we're hesitant to put a lot of new money to work. We know there are things that the market is concerned about, but we know we will see resolution on a lot of these things over the next month and the market will not wait until those things resolve. We could have news on vaccines. We could have news on fiscal stimulus. We could have news on, from the polls. We could have news on trade. There's a number of things that can happen. So we just have to take it day by day. 
If more of our stocks break down, we'll take the money to the sidelines. If more of our sector work breaks down, we'll take the money to the sidelines. We continue to think this is a correction in a long-term bull market. And that as we resolve and get beyond mentally this pandemic and this election, there are many themes that are almost unstoppable, no matter who's in the White House. Cloud computing is not gonna stop. And the digitization of video games is not gonna stop. The changes in the way we do business are gonna stick. Internet retail, for instance. So we wanna be targeted. We wanna stay in the leadership. We're looking hard to recognize change or new leadership to emerge. And we are playing some defense currently, but there's no magic bullet. We have to take it day by day. It's a tactical approach. From a sector perspective, we have less technology than we did at the end of August. And at the end of August, we had less technology than we had at the beginning of August because technology got really overbought. It's about 30% of the market and we're sitting on a bit of cash. Okay. We have significantly, so we have some less materials than we had at the end of August. We have less telecom than we had at the end of August based on the, sorry, not telecom, uh, uh, social media. Uh, we have a little bit less healthcare and we have some more cash and we have virtually no energy. We have very little real estate. So we're avoiding these weak sectors and we are focusing in the stronger groups. In financials, we're focused in FinTech, not in banks because FinTech, again, is almost in an unstoppable theme. If things get worse, we will play defense. We've shown that in the past. We have no aversion to it. We do have some caution on the field right now, and we'll see what the month brings. So we'll continue to update you. Hopefully this is useful. And Pam, if there are any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks, Dave. The biggest question that we keep getting uh, as relationship managers, uh, revolves around our stop loss positioning and the strategic guidance that we have on and across all of our pools. If you could just touch on our stop losses briefly, that would be helpful. Well, you know, I, I, I went, through, went through sort of the process around stops during the course of the call, but just to be clear, um, we use uh, point and figure charts and a few other tools to identify inflection points where a security goes from being in higher highs and higher lows, which is an uptrend and healthy. There are pullbacks within uptrends, that's fine. But when, when we start making lower lows and lower highs, that's a reversal in trend. It means we no longer have uh, that in our favor. And no matter how favorable we are on the fundamentals of a security, if it isn't behaving the way that it should be, given what we think we know, we stop our way out. So if a stock pulls back seven or eight percent, but that is typical as it moves along, rallies 15, pulls back six or seven, rallies 12, pulls back five or six, that's okay. We're not going to try and stop that because that's natural. It's when we get trend reversals. And so we ratchet those stop losses up behind each security. And so you could effectively go into a portfolio at any given time Add, add up the amount of the stop on this security and that security and the next security and get a total risk to stops number. Uh, and that would rarely exceed kind of 10%. Um, but that's, that, that's the role of a stop loss. The stop loss doesn't just sit in the portfolio to protect us against declines. I wanna make this clear. Actually, the more important use of a stop loss is it means we never try to pick a top. So if we went back years, we owned Fairfax Financial from 60, 16 to $600. And there was a multitude of moments when you could have said it's too expensive, we should sell it. But by using a stop, it let us stay in the position as long as it worked. And realistically, every year out of 20 securities, three or four work out way better than you think. Seven or eight are pretty good and a bunch don't work. So you wanna be able to hold those big winners uh, through the course of longer rallies. So we expect that when this correction that we're in right now is done, and we don't think that it's a major one, that there is likely a very significant rally on the other side because the amount of stimulus that's been pushed into the system, monetary and fiscal, uh, and the um, 
the big structural changes that are taking place in the economy should drive growth going forward. Thanks, Dave. Another question here. When we dis de describe the term energy, um, are we referring only to oil and gas or are we including solar and wind as well? Right. So, so as I showed in the, in the deck, um, the problem right now is in carbon-based energy. So that's um, companies that do fracking, it's conventional oil companies, it's energy service companies, uh, the companies that have traditionally found and lifted oil or natural gas or coal. What is clear that really is working is clean energy. And I'll just see if I can't go back and find that chart uh, because um, very different, there it is here. So this is the ETF for the solar industry. So this is a basket of about 20 companies in solar. And you can see we're making new all-time highs today against an energy sector that's down, you know, over 40% since, since March. So um, certainly clean energy has a tailwind. The cost of solar and the cost of wind is now at or below the cost of coal-fired power. You'll probably never build another coal-fired power in a plant in the U.S. And uh, with some additional support uh, from a policy perspective, if the Democrats, for instance, were to be elected, that's going to be very favorable for this group as well. And of course, then you have to have to lump in electric vehicle into the same category. And well, that. Thank you, Dave. Well, that concludes our questions for today. And of course, we always appreciate you guys watching at home and I uh, encourage you all to stay safe. Dave, do you have any final comments? Yeah, certainly. If, if, if anybody would like to talk more specifically about their personal situation, please don't hesitate to call us. I'm happy to jump on the phone at any point uh, and answer questions. You know, our business is, is taking care of families. Uh, it's what we do. Uh, it's what we enjoy doing, and uh, and if we can be of any help or additional help, please don't hesitate to, to give us a call. The last thing I wanted to mention is we'll put out a notification next week. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about public markets. As many of you know, uh, we uh, went through a merger transaction with a company called Roundtable Partners, who had a lot of focus in alternative investments. Uh, they've had a lot of success in uh, in a number of different alternative investment products. And so we're going to do a call next week on the role, the complementary role of alternative investments beside public market securities as diversifiers and portfolios. Uh, they may be, may not be for everybody. I think that there's some really interesting things going on and we'll have some interesting uh, products coming in the course of the fall. So I uh, look forward to, to uh, talking about that perhaps next week. I think with Jeff Spidel from, from uh, was initially round table capital now barometer capital management. So Great thanks Dave. everybody for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Look forward to it. Take care everyone. Thanks for joining us.